When testing a printer, it is normal to focus on the feature that the manufacturer is touting. So with a Soval SV08, well, that's an easy to assemble Voron. With a Bamboo Lab A1 Mini, that's a compact and affordable multicolor option. With the FL Sun S1, that's speed. And it boasts 1,200 millimeters per second at 40K acceleration. That's quite a boast. I want to start with addressing that and getting it out of the way because I want to see what is behind that 1,200 millimeters per second. So stay tuned and let's pick apart the FL Sun S1. And boy, do I have a lot to say about this printer. First up, and this is probably on a lot of people's minds, this printer was delayed. It's been seven months since we saw our first glimpse and we still don't have it yet, but we are expecting it in our warehouse on July 4th. It was delayed due to bugs. However, I am really happy that they did wait Obviously, we want a printer that works, even if it's released late, rather than a printer that doesn't work that is released early. More so than at any other time, probably, our manufacturers trying to release their new printer to the masses as quickly as possible. So I am glad that Evelson did delay things so that they could iron out those bugs. Still, it was trying our patience. But testing this printer over the last few weeks, I am pretty happy with it. I haven't really run into any significant issues, and reliability-wise, I am pretty happy with it. Speeds like what is described here are basically unheard of in consumer 3D printing. Yes, there are a lot of DIY devices that can boast 1000 millimeters per second plus, but this is kind of the first time a major company has done something like this. 1200 millimeters per second, that is, that is quite the boast. So can it really print that fast? Well, yep, yeah, here is a Benchy printed at similar speeds and it came out really well and it took eight minutes to print. Eight. That's fast and it printed pretty well, but I know what you're saying. This is a milky white translucent filament. Show me something else. Well, here is one in black and here is one in purple. They printed pretty well in eight minutes. That's, that's impressive. Manufacturers love to send these milky white translucent filaments as their test spool. I'm pretty sure every reviewer has this rage attack every time they see this. So what about something else? Maybe another model, perhaps? Well, at the time of recording this video, Ethelson have not released their new slicer. So I don't have any pre-prepped files to run from besides what was on the actual printer. But I really do want to slice my own files and try and get the best profile that I can out of it. And I am using Prusa Slicer right now, which works really well with our V400. And that's why I've tried it. So I'm using that, but it does require some tweaking. So first up, the benches that I printed. This one is with the test filament that came with the printer. This is FL Sun's ultra high speed filament. This one is Esun's EPLAHS, and this one is Polymaker's Polysonic PLA. So these are all high speed filaments, and we'll get back to that later. But I want to know how well it can print a standard PLA filament, as well as other standard filaments as well. So where to start with a standard PLA? Well, first of all, we got to do a flow test. And this is actually slightly hard for me because with the other printers that I've worked with, ones that label themselves as high speed as well, our Eco PLA has a max flow uh, in the late 20s, maybe up to 30 millimeters cubed per second. Whereas this printer has a flow of 110 millimeters cubed per second. That's, that's quite a difference. Just look at this hot end. It is huge and compared to the Creal K1 hot end yeah that's quite a difference okay so where the hell do I start with a filament that has a max flow of around 30 and a printer that has a max flow of 110 okay so I'm just going to start it with 30 and we'll go up in intervals of 10 and see what happens Okay, so we got an absolute max flow with our Eco PLA at 230 degrees of 75 millimeters cubed per second. That's really good, but that is a far cry from 110. A flow of 75 millimeters cubed per second at 0.2 millimeter layers gives a max linear speed of around 900 millimeters per second. So we can put 900 millimeters per second as our default speed. However, normally we don't print external perimeters, bridging, overhangs, and such at a max speed. 
External perimeter is generally 75% of the top speed, so that means 675 millimeters per second for externals. So let's do that. And so here is our red Eco PLA printed at those speeds. And here is our matte PLA, which was also printed at this speed. Okay, so for regular PLA, we might not be able to get 110 millimeters cubed per second at sane temperatures. However, we have tried this with other high speed filaments like uh, Polymaker's Polysonic PLA, and we did two tests. So, first of all, we did a test at 30 millimeters cubed per second, and we also did a second test at 110 millimeters cubed per second. And the second test, we got under extrusion of about 7% at 110 millimeters cubed per second. So, I'm going to give it to them. That's not that far off. So you can print up to that flow rate thereabouts, but not with standard filaments. But with high speed filament, you get nice results. This is Polymaker's Polysonic PLA. And look at that. Isn't that nice? So what about other filaments? Well, this is kind of where the S1 comes into its own because we have been printing our 3D Jake ASA and ABS and we did some VAS mode prints. And look at that. We are printing at around 80 millimeters cube per second and it was eating through our spool. It was going so quick. It was doing layers in about 1.5 seconds and this printed in just under an hour. Uh, forget this part. I forgot to tell the effector to rise up in the NG code after finishing the print. Rookie mistake. The best thing about printing with these filaments is that we are not so restricted by part cooling. In fact, I was printing this with 100% part cooling. The one thing I did notice with these prints was that if you look closely, you can see a considerable amount of salmon skin. And I printed this at varying speeds and varying temperatures. As you can see, this one is a little more glossy than the other one that was printed slower. And then I printed it out of PLA as well. This is uh, Polyterra, army purple, I think. And it is also noticeable, but with other prints, I didn't notice the salmon skin as much. And I guess this is just due to printing really fast at thin layers. For those wondering how well it can print tougher materials like nylon, a while back we tried to make our own bow, and a lot of those nylon carbon fiber parts were printed on the S1. I am very happy with how these turned out. Okay, so speed is the noticeable thing when you check out this printer, but don't let that fool you. This thing has a few nifty features up its sleeve. Okay, first up, let's start easy. This printer uses volcano nozzles, so it is very easy to find one and swap it out if you need to. No quick swaps though, sorry. Okay, what else? So the interface. So this printer uses clipper, so you can use mainsail. Uh, I've been using it, it is awesome, but I am also quite impressed with the screen. It is very detailed and everything is not super dense or overwhelming. It is a similar size to the V400 screen, but has way more info. Uh, one thing I really like is this. They built a scales into the spool holder. So for anyone using spools that don't really have a cutout so you can see how much filament you have left, this is kind of handy. It only measures to the nearest 10% and it is calibrated for one kilogram spools only, but it is still pretty useful and I have used it with great practicality. Everything is pretty standard in the print menu. You've got temperature, you've got your time, speed, Z offset, but on the control tab, we have this. This is info on the dry box. Yeah, this printer has an inbuilt dry box. It has a seal and a desk and pouch and is properly insulated. On the screen, there is a temperature reading and humidity reading. One not so great thing about this though is that it has no temperature control. It just shoots up all the way to 60 degrees. So halfway between PLA and halfway between nylon. I'm not quite sure where they were going with this. One thing I noticed about this printer that is missing that I think should not be missing is despite this printer having a hardened steel nozzle, an enclosure and a dry box, obviously meant for high temp materials, it doesn't have a temperature reading for the chamber. It really should. In your settings tab, you have your Wi-Fi and your AI features. I'm not sure why print resume and run out sensor are under AI, but the other features are first layer checks, debris, spaghetti, and clog sensors. There is a built-in webcam to detect all of these issues, as well as special sensors on the motors that can detect a clog in your hot end. And if you like, you can just turn them off. Normally, I'm not a fan of these. They often are a bit hit and miss. However, I was testing this, I printed something, and I left the workshop for 10 minutes and came back and it paused saying that there was an obstruction on the bed. So I looked at the bed and everything looked completely normal. I thought it was a false positive. So I just hit resume and it continued. And then as it was going over the print at the back, it snagged it and it fell off. The whole brim part of that corner fell off. So 
it actually did detect this, but it only fell off the bed for like a second. And that's all it required to detect that problem. So it wasn't that bad, actually. It was pretty good. I also got a false positive when I was doing the flow test. So we were hitting around 110 millimeters cube per second and the hot end and extruder was starting to struggle and it paused because it thought there was a blockage. That's not bad, actually. Uh, not so great for flow tests, but for general printing, that's pretty okay. I found the clog feature to be quite useful as well. When I was entering filament through the PTFE tube, there's a little coupler here and it had a snag. I'm not entirely sure why there is a coupler there, but as you push filament down, it will experience some resistance as it passes that coupler, which is exacerbated when the effector is high and the PTFE tube is bent slightly. I thought the filament had actually entered the extruder and I got it to extrude and print. And as the first layer was going down, the printer paused and let me know that there was a problem. So that's also pretty good. By the way, I have actually experienced two snags. So there's one when you put the filament in at the coupler, but then when you're removing the filament, it, it tends to stick just over the extruder. So the extruder will retract everything automatically from the menu, but it just snags there. So you kind of need to pull the filament up with a bit of strength sometimes. And as of literally this morning, I have seen other people online describing the same problem. So if this does happen to you, I recommend taking the spool off the spool holder and pulling the spool with the filament strand instead of just pulling the filament strand so that it doesn't bend or break. Haven't had a breakage yet, but with a brittle filament like carbon fiber, that might happen. So just in case you know what to do. As for flow calibration, I initially thought it was a pressure advance calibration, but it's, it's not. I'm sorry. It would have been cool though. This prints some lines much like a pressure advanced calibration and in increasing flow and a laser scans them to see where the optimal flow is. It then adjusts it accordingly to your print. In our general settings, there is also an option to turn the printer off after a print job. And of course, we got the usual file history like pretty much every other clipper or clipper style printer on the market. Going back to the dry box, it only fits one kilogram spools or smaller. But if you are the kind to use larger spools, you will be happy to know that FL Sun added a little hole in the side with a short PTFE tube so that you can use external spool holders for larger spools if you wish. However, this does bypass the filament sensor, so you can't use that with external spools. Now, the one thing that you will notice when you're using this printer for the first time, besides how large it is, it's loud. It's really loud. This printer can print up to 1,200 millimeters per second, so it needs to have good cooling. And for that, we have a CPAP. This is essentially a large high powered radial fan with a tube that runs to the printhead. And it is very effective and very loud. If you're planning on getting this, you need to put it in a suitable place, far from anyone else. I don't think it's a good idea to have this in your living room or your bedroom. You're going to have issues. This is actually just under the legal limit for consumer devices in the EU. So I kind of think the engineers at FL Sun were like, oh, guys, this is way too loud. We got to cap the fan speed. And then another engineer was like, oh, but that means we got to cap the print speed. Eh. OK, that's basics out of the way. What about the internals? So as I said before, this printer does run Clipper and it has mainsail, which means you have access to the CFG and everything firmware wise. It runs 5160 drivers. So these motors are a bit heftier. Of course, look at the size of this thing. Look at how fast it goes. And we can also see that it does enable the M600 command. Color changes are possible. So if you are a Hue Forger, then you have this as an option without editing. After a few weeks of using this, I am quite impressed with how fast it can print. But the question remains, do you really need to print that fast? Don't get me wrong, everyone loves high speed prints and when they come out at good quality, that is really awesome. However, as we saw with our Eco PLA flow tests, you can print at those high, high speeds with a standard PLA. You need to use a high speed filament like Polymaker's Polysonic, Eason's EPLA HS, or FL Sun's test filament that came with the printer. Yeah, a, a decent standard filament will be able to print really fast on this, print faster than your K1, than your Bamboo Lab X1, than any other printer that is on the market, really. 
but you can't reach those high, high speeds. 1,200 millimeters per second is not gonna work for a standard PLA. You've gotta bring it down a bit, 900 max. But this printer is enclosed. It has a hardened steel nozzle. It has a dry box that goes up to a temperature of 65 degrees. I don't think the engineers at FL Sun had regular PLA in mind when they were putting this together. So if you are printing with regular PLA or with a satin PLA or with a matte PLA, just keep that in mind. It's hard to give a final say on this printer. I love it, but it might come down to the budget because this is 1,399 euro in the shop right now. If you wanted something like this, but a little toned down with lower specs, then you could get the T1 because that is just under 600 euro in the shop right now, can print it at 1,000 millimeters per second at 30K acceleration. It's not that much of a step down for that price. But do you really need the speed? As an example, a Bamboo Lab printer, a Creality printer, and any cubic printer can now print a Benchy in 13 to 16 minutes at good quality. This prints at eight. So do you really need those few minutes? That's kind of what it comes down to. So maybe for prototypers, this is a great choice. With the dry box, the hardened steel nozzle, the enclosure, you can print any common filament under the sun and it prints fast and at good quality. For the DIYers, this printer runs Clipper, so that is easy to adjust and edit. However, it's a Delta, keep that in mind. It is difficult to mod the hot end and the extruder. It does have an accelerometer built in, so if you do change something, you can do an automatic resonance calibration test and it will be fine. But there are reasons you don't see extruder or hot end upgrades for Delta printers. I like this printer. I really, really do. It is a very powerful printer, but it might not be right for you. Objectively, I love it. But whether it's right for you is a very subjective question. I hope this product breakdown has helped those of you looking for a new powerful printer. If you have any questions about the S1 or the T1 that is coming out soon, then you can write a comment below. You can send us an email. You can also join us on our Discord server. The link is down below. And we'll see you guys next time. Later.